Good evening and welcome to the Democratic debate for Brooklyn's 51st Assembly District. I am your co-moderator, Rob Aguilar. I would like to thank the debate committee that worked to put this event together and also our sponsoring partners. Center for Family Life, Chinese American Planning Council, Love Trump's Hate, Sunset Park, Misteca, the Sunset Park Podcast, and Voces Ciudadanas. I'd now like to introduce you to our co-moderator, Shana Castillo. Shana, welcome to the debate. Thank you, Robin. Good evening, everyone. It's really great to be with you all virtually. Um, my name is Shana Castillo. I'm a longtime Sunset Park resident, local school parent, and member of Love Trump State Sunset Park. And now we'll bring on the candidates. First up, Genesis Aquino. Genesis, welcome. Welcome. Thank you for organizing this. Uh, my name you. is Hennessy Sakino, and I am a long-term Sunset Park resident. I grew up here. I am an immigrant as well from the Dominican Republic and has been living in Sunset Park since 2001. I recently became a citizen in 2014. And since, since then, I decided you know, to get more involved in electoral politics. Uh, but before that, I have been organizing uh, for workers' rights in New York City. I am the co-chair of the Laundry Worker Center. I organize to make sure that laundry workers, well, warehouse workers, as well as restaurant restaurant workers and domestic workers have uh, rights, uh, labor rights in New York State. And I am also a housing rights advocate. I work right now in the housing court helping tenants who do not have legal representation, as well as assisting small homeowners so that they do not get displaced from uh, our New York City communities. Thank you. And next we have Felix Ortiz. Felix, thank you. welcome thank to you the very debate. Welcome. Can you hear me? Yes, Good? we can hear yes. you loud okay. and clear. Are you gonna, you, I'm going to be asking you often because sometimes I have problems with this. Uh, first of sure. all, I would like to thank uh, all the sponsors. I would like to thank all of you for having us together to try to uh, express our concerns ourselves. Uh, I came to, uh, to Brooklyn when I was 22 years old uh, from Puerto Rico. Uh, when I came to this country, I couldn't speak English. I worked for Banco Popular. Then I worked for the Department of City Planning. Uh, then I worked for the Office of Management and Budget, as well as for the Bronzeboro President Office, Fernando Ferrer. As well, I was in charge of the home care program that provided uh, services for uh, HIV uh, patients and uh, uh, that was uh, expecting to, uh, to be... Uh, to be transferred uh, to a better life. Uh, that was a program that was developed between the uh, city and the federal government. Uh, after that, I got elected to the assembly. I've been elected uh, since 1994, serving the great uh, constituents of the 51st assembly district. And I'm very proud to continue to be here. And I'm very proud that the people of the district continue to send me back to Albany. And I'm looking forward for the conversation. Thank you, Felix. And now we have uh, Marcela Mitainez. Marcela, welcome. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Um, so my name is Marcela Mitainez. Um, my story is not typical of someone who's running for um, public office, but is very typical of folks in our community. Um, I came here as an undocumented immigrant with my family, and we settled in Sunset Park. I grew up on 47th Street and 7th Avenue. And over the years, um, my family migrated from Peru and four generations of my family had roots here in Sunset Park. Um, in 2006, I got displaced by um, a new owner that um, uh, I got displaced from a home that I shared for over 30 years with my family, not understanding why it was happening, seeing the same thing happening to my neighbors, running into them at different places to ask for help. I didn't understand what was happening, and I slowly learned that the laws that currently exist allowed for the type of displacement that was happening. Um, I got into a community organization, started educating tenants on their rights, providing leadership development, and really growing um, a, a grassroots effort here in Sunset Park to try and change what was happening with the housing, particular uh, with the uh, aggressive and um, landlords. Uh, we started working in a coalition, and in 2019, we were part of history when we bought the historic rent laws of 2019. Um, 
that showed not just me and the folks in our community that we have individual power and the difference when we come together and we cultivate that power. Um, I feel like that's what's lacking in our community. There's a lot of folks that are um, working class people that don't feel that they're being represented. Um, and I want that to change. I want our community to be inclusive of everyone. Thank you, Marcella. And up next, Catherine Walsh. Catherine, Catherine. welcome to the debate. Hi, thank you. My name is Catherine Walsh, and I am a Sunset Park resident, born and raised here. And my family um, was uh, first immigrated to, to Red Hook a couple generations ago. I went to PS 503 and then PS 102 and graduated from Midwood High School. I was a teacher for a couple of years. I ran, I ran a Chinese language program. I've lived and worked in China, and I've now spent the last 10 years working with city and state governments across the country on developing climate action solutions across a variety of challenges that cities are facing around housing, transportation, and developing a local green jobs economy. I am a community board seven member working to protect the community. I am also the elected chair of the Assembly District Democratic County Committee. And I am proud to be partnered in this race with Julio Pena, who is running for the district leader position. I'm running for this seat because the challenges that we've been facing in this district have worsened over the last two decades. We are facing an affordability crisis. We are facing a environmental and climate crisis. We are now dealing with the implications from COVID and recovery and supporting our small businesses and, and workers. And it is gonna take all of our might in Albany over the next two years, over this tenure, to make sure that the legislation that's being introduced and then the budget that's being introduced really protects and supports our, our families across the, the entire district. Great. Thank you, Catherine. So we're gonna go over now the rules of the debate. And the rules of the debate are as follows. There are going to be four rounds and two questions per round. Each candidate will have 90 seconds to answer the question, and you'll receive one minute to answer any follow-up questions. Our timekeepers this evening are Jorge Muñiz, John Santori, and Cynthia Felix. Also, we are going to uh, have translators, and uh, si quieren escuchar el debate en español, pueden marcar al teléfono que ven en pantalla. We also have Chinese translation, and uh, they can dial the number on the screen. We ask of the candidates that you kind of speak a little slowly so that the translators can, can keep up with you. And uh, we encourage our viewers who are watching live to send us their comments, um, their questions, and some of their questions might make it uh, to the debate. So with all that, let's begin. Great, thank you, Rob. Thank you, candidates. Um, as a reminder to everyone joining us, Assembly District 51 is home to more than 120,000 local residents, stretching from Northern Bay Ridge into Sunset Park, parts of Borough Park, South Slope, and of course, Red Hook. Well, we're gonna get started with our topic of economy and the police. Um, in order to create the community format that we intend for this debate, we'll be referring to all candidates by their first names, and they will start off with each topic area in alphabetical order of their last name. So with that, Henesis will go first. Again, these are 90 seconds each for the first question, which is, after a global pandemic, many are wondering how to rebuild and strengthen New York's economy. In particular, District 51 has been hit with high unemployment rates. What is your plan to help workers and small businesses? Uh, <clears throat> so I think right now due to this pandemic, it is uh, imperative that we pass an emergency relief uh, bill to make sure that we are protecting the small businesses in our community, since they are uh, one of the main employers here. Uh, we have three main corridors, commercial corridors, Third Avenue, Fourth uh, Avenue, and Fifth Avenue. And 
I would say that about 30% of those businesses I won't be able to open because they were not able to get any assistance from the federal government. And I think it is our responsibility in the state legislature to make sure that we are protecting those businesses by um, in, in, um, increasing our investment in minority and women-owned businesses, which are the majority in District 51. I also think that before Corona, a lot of the, our community members were already working in very exploitative conditions. We need to make sure that we are uh, regulating the gig economy. A lot of uh, our local uh, taxi drivers are being affected because they are competing with companies like Uber and Lyft uh, that are big corporations and do not uh, give any protection to the workers. We also need to make sure that we are, uh, I'm almost running out of time, that we are um, investing in our uh, waterfront. We need to make sure that whatever happens there is for the best of the community, that we are having job training, that we are bringing green jobs accessible to the local people who live in Sunset Park and Red Hook. Thank you, great on time. A follow-up question, 60 seconds, is Sunset Park and Red Hook waterfronts have provided much uh, needed employment for the communities, yet there is a great conversation and debate around which are the right developments for these waterfronts. Uh, what are your thoughts on how our waterfronts should be used to spur economic growth and greater employment? Uh, like I said, uh, right now, New York City and New York State have passed one of the most progressive uh, legislation uh, when it comes to environmental justice. Sorry, you hear this? I live in a very noisy block. Uh, you hear everything, even if my windows are shut. Uh, we. I got this concentrated with the music outside. Sorry, what was the question? Uh, the question was, uh, what are your ideas around how to best use the waterfront to spur economic growth and greater employment? Yes, yeah, so in our waterfront, we need to make sure that we are being included in the green jobs that are coming to New York State and New York City because we need to meet our goal so that we can be in accordance to our climate justice uh, bills that we passed recently last year. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, we are investing in uh, infrastructure so that the people who are working already here, the small businesses, are getting up-to-date information, upgrading their systems so they don't let, they're not left behind. Time. I do think that the- Okay, thank you, that was time. Thank you. Marcella. Please, 90 seconds. Um, with the historic unemployment rate that has left many of our neighbors without work and our small businesses struggling, uh, what would you do as a state assembly member? Yes, um, our community is struggling, um, but those that are struggling more are our um, immigrant neighbors who have no protection and no access to um, any of the social services available. Um, one way we can help small businesses and workers is to cancel the rent. Cancel the rent for small biz uh, for residential and commercial units. That'll bring much needed relief for businesses and give them an opportunity to to kind of come back into this um, into the economy that we have as we start opening up the um, the city. Um, renters, it's one thing less that they have to worry about. We're not talking about having to pay it months later. We're talking about cancel it completely during the period of the COVID-19. Um, something else that we can do, um, we need to find a way of uh, putting money back into the economy and giving folks an opportunity to, to really sustain themselves and try and come out of what's happening while the rest of the, the, the community and the, the, um, the city comes back to life. Uh, one untapped resource um, is actually trying to tax the rich. It's a way of getting money. We're talking about taxing the ultra wealthy, um, a percentage that they won't even notice. Um, they have so much wealth and really trying to pass that on um, to our working class folks as an opportunity to give them um, resources that we don't currently have. Thank you, you're at time. Uh, 60 second follow up, can you elaborate more on the tax, tax the rich, and what resources would you redirect with these funds? Yeah, so there is a big push um, uh, to get funding that's needed for social services. 
Um, and so there's a list of things that can actually be taxed. And one example is like a yacht tax or a, a tax on the, the wealth and the money that they have just sitting in their bank account. Um, but for more information on that, you can actually visit my website at Marcella for NY where it goes into more detail. But the idea is understanding that these folks are going to be taxed and they, it's not going to affect them, but that's money that we can use for things like, um, providing additional affordable housing, uh, programs like healthcare programs, like, um, even, even just money, the city just, uh, set aside some money for specifically for immigrants that don't qualify and aren't eligible for the federal um, assistance at hand. We need to be able to provide, and they are members of our community. And this, even though they're not paying federal income taxes, they are paying other types Time. of taxes. Thank you. Thank you, Marcella. Mm -hmm. Felix, 90 seconds with the uh, historic unemployment rates. Uh, what would you do to support the district workers and small businesses? as assembly member okay so i'm i'm uh, i'm agreed uh, i'm agree with the prior uh, statement i think uh, it's very important also to add to that that we should be able to uh, develop workforce development in our in our community by using our non-profit organization that we have in place such as F center for family life cpc and others i think it's very important that they be able to have the resources to uh, uh, develop some technical technical program for our uh, our high school students for our community. The other thing that we should be continuing to do, which I have done, is to ensure that we can have a student from telecommunication and Sunset Park uh, High School to have internship in the in the ongoing businesses that we have in the waterfront. Uh, that they will be able to develop some skills. I think that will be that will be very important. Secondly, regarding uh, the small businesses. I'm very happy to say that uh, whatever resources we put in place from the state government, because we can't wait from Washington uh, to really lift our small businesses and any, any one of us. I think canceled rent is, a, is, 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 is should be a priority. Uh, eliminating the, these uh, small businesses to pay their, their rent as well as their mortgages, that would be another opportunity to help them to lift their businesses and to continue to uh, to function in our community. I think uh, the only thing is that is very critical is that uh, that also we've we'll been helping we've we'll been helping some of the small businesses, especially the bodegueros that I do have a relationship with a lot of them is to to make sure that they fill out the paperwork uh, from the state and the Fed that they will be able to get some funding, including that includes some of the of the beauty salons time. that has been come to my office to talk about. You're at time. Thank you. A uh, 60 second follow up question on the same topic. The Comptroller estimates that nearly one in five New Yorkers, over 18% is currently without work. So what would you do as assembly member to propose a solution that is as large as the problem currently at hand? Well, I think I think a couple of things. I think we have learned from uh, from COVID-19 uh, that we will shortchange uh, because we didn't have the real manufacturers in place to build uh, or to create uh, respiratory as well as uh, ventilator as well as mask. I think we need to make sure that the, uh, the state of New York uh, will be able through EDC, uh, the same way that they help some of the companies to uh, get some C money, that we will be able to continue to encourage uh, some of these manufacturers now that they are doing uh, some of this equipment to uh, stay alive by providing them mechanism to, uh, to enhance and expand. Uh, the other thing is that we have to continue to make sure that we invest in uh, manufactured jobs and also uh, renewal jobs, as well as uh, wind energy, and also make sure we be able to have the, the workforce that we need to invest uh, to have our kid to learn how to fix the, the solar panel. Uh, this is the job of the future, and we need to move in that direction, and that's uh, uh, what I, how I will use uh, the areas that we have in our community to ensure right. that we enhance and move. Thank you. Uh, so, Katie, 90 seconds. Again, what would you do as state assembly member to address this historic unemployment rate that has left many of our neighbors without work and more vulnerable than ever, and to support our small businesses? 
So there was an opportunity that was presented to the current state legislature in in the midst of COVID to tackle this crisis and to recognize and grapple with the, the exposure that our community had and the vulnerability that our community had. And the state legislature failed to do that. And there were many bills that were introduced and the ones that were the most ambitious um, to actually do what needed to get done to protect uh, families in their homes and to, and to cancel rent um, and also to think ahead and be really aggressive to protect small businesses and workers didn't happen. Um, the the two ways that we we make these changes is through budget justice. It's making sure that the budget that passes in Albany reflects our priorities and reflects our values. And the state legislature failed to do that at a time. And so what, what that means in terms of backing that up with legislation and backing that up with the policies in place, it means, for example, we, we rewrite the rules. And so we, we require a commercial vacancy tax for the landlords here in New York, a lot of them are big private equity firms and they sit and they wait in in, in pre-COVID times and in COVID times because they're looking for the highest bidder. And that is something that has been discussed in the city that would really support our district here across the entire district and, and has not been advanced and because it needs to be passed at the state right. level. So that, thank you. Thank you. 60 second follow-up question. Uh, what would you do as state assembly member to build coalition to pass the legislation that you fault uh, the current legislator for not passing? What are your there, what are your coalition building methods, and what bills would you prioritize? Just to re great. Uh, no problem. So there is a, a piece of legislation, one of the ones I'm just referring to, which um, failed, and it was authored uh, by a assembly member in Queens, and it was supported by the a lot of the housing justice advocates, and that was one of the things that didn't did, didn't move ahead and didn't pass. Um, there is another piece which I would champion. There is another piece of legislation that is specifically looking at for example, rewriting the rules of the insurance industry so to give relief to small businesses, and that specifically would allow them to have relief during COVID. Um, and that is another bill and piece of legislation that needs to get passed that has had a, a lot of uh, cross uh, community support. And so a lot of a lot of this is about the approach to the legislation. Uh, my my role as a legislator is in partnership, is in support of making sure that we have a budget and and policy that really reflects what is needed from the, the community up. Sorry. Thank you, candidates. And I'll pass it over to Rob for question two. Great, thank you. So this question will be for Hennessy's. Hennessy's, um, as tens of thousands take to the streets demanding justice for police violence that has hurt and killed black and brown lives, Many are now calling on New York leaders to defund the police. Do you agree with that movement? Yes, I do agree with that movement. I think it is, it is a necessary step uh, towards justice, uh, especially now when the governor decided to, quote, to cut the budget tremendously. And the same thing done by our um, uh, Mayor de Blasio. Uh, I think the NYPD gets sufficient fund to do what it needs to do. And unfortunately, the money is being used to police uh, communities like this one in the 51st Assembly District, brown and bl uh, black and brown communities. So uh, the money should be redistributed to make sure that we are having enough services for people to have a safe home, to make sure that our youth are not in the street and we can refund again at all the youth programs to make sure that our local public schools are uh, funded and that we have uh, funding for HPD because there's a lot of tenants right now living in horrible conditions. Um, those those are the programs that need to be funded. And again, I believe that part of the funding, the, the NYPD is part of uh, our call for budget justice. Uh, there's no, uh, you cannot tackle violence without attacking the institutional um, uh, structure that, Violate, violate our bodies and our communities and our families. 
and leave us in state of poverty. So I do agree with defunding the NYPD. Now, a uh, follow-up to that, the governor says that the protesters have won, <laughs> that they don't need to go to the streets anymore. And some changes have recently been enacted. Um, are those changes enough? Have those that took to the streets won? Those changes are definitely not enough. Uh, he, passing, you know, PTA and, you know, another bill is not enough. We need more than that. And like, again, uh, again, uh, violence is not just with the with the police. Violence is every day when our schools don't have money. Violence is every day when our children have a school to prison pipeline. Uh, so we need to make sure that this, all the schools in New York State, not only New York City, have less funding for uh, police uh, surveillance. We need to make sure that the schools have more social workers and more supportive staff. We need to make sure that we have more restorative justice uh, community centers. Those are the things that need to be funded in order for us to have criminal justice reform. And I think Cuomo should be committed to that. We need to hold him accountable for that. So we are far from being, uh, from, you know, we just won a small a battle, but now the war. I think we have a long way to go to make sure that the police is held accountable in the whole state of New York. Thank you. Marcela. Uh, same, same question. Yeah, um, I think that the the, well, the, the, the original question was: as tens of thousands of people took to the streets uh, to end violence, and uh, now a lot of people are going to uh, defund the police. Um, do you agree with that movement? Yes. Um, the police violence and harassment is not is, is something that's not new to the communities of uh, black and brown working class communities. Um, defunding the police is something that's caught on and it's important for folks to understand. That doesn't mean that we're getting, um, we want to take the amount of money that they're receiving and put it into other services, but also we don't need to keep buying these equipments that they have to militarize them. Um, it was very eye-opening um, when I was out marching with protesters and my neighbors, including from Sunset Park. While we were coming to protest peacefully, we were met with police with shields, with um, uh, pepper spray that they were using. The cops used their bikes as weapons to try and push us back. So understanding that they don't need um, they don't need these monies. Again, trying to use that money to reinvest in communities. Um, let's stop the school to prison pipeline. Let's put our money to um, have counselors, invest in counselors to help with, with conflicts in schools, um, invest in mental health services and have counselors and, and health providers be able to respond to those types of um, calls. So trying to to separate those things. Great, thank you. Now we've also seen that ICE and the NYPD are collaborating. Uh, what can you do if you become our assembly member to, or do you agree with ICE and NYPD collaborating? And if you don't, what can, we, what can be done to, to impede that? Yes, I, I don't believe that they should be, I don't be, I don't believe we should be using state and city resources um, to help um, deportation. Um, what we can do at the state level is actually pass laws that prevent um, ICE from coming into our courts, from coming into our schools and coming into our hospitals. Um, very recently we saw somebody who was here on a, on a, on a tourist visa um get shot in the face and because ice came and was looking for someone and even though they were hurt and even though in their hospital and they had families that were desperate trying to make sure that their family members were okay ice was able to enter the hospital and take take who they came for and that's very scary and we need to make sure at the state level we have the ability to be able to pass laws to prevent that from happening thank you 
Felix, so I'll repeat the question again. It's uh, as tens of thousands take to the streets demanding justice for police violence that has hurt and killed black and brown lives, many are now calling on New York's leaders to defund the police. Do you agree with that? I think not only we should uh, defund the police and agree with the prior two uh, candidates, I think it's uh, imperative that we also begin to have a conversation how to dismantle the Department of Correction and the Department of Juvenile Justice. I think, uh, I think, uh, I think we, it's a lot of work ahead of us uh, to ensure that people in, uh, like ourselves uh, in minority community, you know, 59% of the African American in, are in the jail system, 31% Hispanic, that makes 90%. Uh, and we continue to be, uh, to be the target to, uh, to, make, uh, to make somebody else rich. So I think uh, uh, we need to do that, and then we need to ensure that we will be able uh, to uh, relocate all those resources uh, for workforce development, number one, to ensure that we will be able to, ha to enhance our nonprofit organization in our community that have lost resources. I think it's very imperative that we continue uh, to allocate resources where they need it, now, to build affordable housing, low-income housing. I agree with the prior one. I, it's a lot of background noise. I cannot hear. I don't know if you can hear me. Uh, we can but, hear you. Okay. So, but also we, we should we should work together with HPD to look for places uh, that we can take over to make sure that we begin to uh, to build low income housing. So uh, the answer automatically is yes. I think militarization in the police department. Forget about the equipment that they buy. Uh, we need to we need to ban all those some of those equipment, including pepper pepper spray. Uh, police thank, department thank should not be using pepper spray anymore. Time. Thank you. So, Catherine. Um, same question for you, and I'll repeat it. Um, as tens of thousands take to the streets demanding justice for police violence that has hurt and killed black and brown lives, many are now calling on New York's leaders to defund the police. Do you agree with that movement? Yes, I, I believe with the um, you know bottom of my heart that there is no way that you can be in the state or the city of New York and tolerate the situation that we have found ourselves in over the last couple of, of decades. And now is the time to be bold. Now is the time to radically rethink how we are passing legislation, how we are passing budgets to, to re reflect our communities. And that money that is funding um, and, and the use of excessive force is money that is being provided by taxpayer dollars. And it's really about allocating. That's money that belongs to our parents with their schools. That's money that belongs to everyone who is working day in and day out to provide them with health care. That money is belonging to our, our families and allowing them to have a safe place to, to live. And so it's really about taking bold measures right now, faced with what we're dealing with at the state level with COVID, but actually thinking big picture about what kind of changes we wanna make. There is legislation that has been introduced that hasn't yet passed that would that would look at, again, trying to protect um, our, our communities, right? We need to make sure that we repeal the walking while, while trans ban. We need to make sure that we repeal um, any racial profiling ref, uh, tools that are being used. Right. And okay, Do you, what are your thoughts on the expansion of 500 new MTA officers? We should not be using the MTA police officers. We should not have MTA police officers in our subways. We need to move away from further policing in our communities. And that, again, is money that is being used by taxpayer dollars, that we do not have a say over it being used. And again, it's the it's the opposite thing that needs to happen. We actually need to make investments in MTA and um, our public infrastructure. We need to find ways to actually make our fares free. I've worked with dozens of cities across the, the U.S. that are have introduced that kind of legislation. So again, the communities like ours can be able to ride public transportation for free. Great. Thank you. 
Thank you, candidate. So um, next we're gonna get to some audience questions, some that are being submitted now live and some in advance. Uh, you'll have 60 seconds to respond. Um, Henesis, I'll start with you first. This was submitted by our neighbor, Lewis. I have the citizen app on my phone and every day it alerts me that someone in my neighborhood was held up at knife or gunpoint. I feel less safe than ever and, cur and curious if city officials are aware. What would your plan be to address crime in your neighborhood? And again, what a preference that there is a very slight uptick in the single digits and certain uh types of crime um but there is a perception among some of our neighbors that there is an increase in crime post-covid um i do think that we uh i, I mean i have the citizen citizens citizen app and i personally has seen lately a lot of gun, you know, gun shooting. And I do think that we need to do better when it comes to controlling guns in our communities. We need to make sure that we have better relationship with, you know, police officers, if any, uh, because our communities, unfortunately, do not have the trust. And we need to be, we need to make sure that we are investing in community programs where people feel safe turning in their guns, where people, uh, where parents have programs and after school, you know, programs for their youth so that they are out of, uh, you know, bad steps, right? So we need to make sure that we are putting our money, uh, defunding the NYPD and making sure that the money is going to gun safety, that the money is going to youth programs. I think that's the best solution we can have right now to make sure that we are reducing crime and improving the relationships with the uh, NYPD. Thank you. Marcella, a question from Karen. What kind of legislation can propel the NYPD to fire officers with excessive lawsuits? What kind of legislation for, I'm sorry, can you repeat it? Sure, what kind of legislation can propel the NYPD to fire officers with excessive lawsuits? Oh, we did it. I think that that's something that we need to look in and we need to develop. I think as we start seeing more transparency um, with records that we didn't have access to before, I think we're going to start seeing um, patterns that we need to learn from that. We need to understand why this is happening and how, but more importantly, we need to make sure that we're, 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 we're taking steps to not allow that to happen. Um, they need to be disciplined right away. Um, they need to be um, held accountable right away. This is not something that um, that should be swept under the rug. This is not something that should be um, isolated when they're going to um, a new job, a new employment. What we're hearing now, especially with the 50A and wanting to be able to see an officer's record, is that there some there is some systemic pattern of abuse and violence that's being perpetuated and thank so you, Tommy. thank you marcella felix um from alexander please speak about your plans for uh youth vocational training okay good that's a good question youth location training this is what we need to do we have for example for center for family life we have the Chinese Planning Council to mention just few. Uh, we need to we need to empower those organizations that they will be able uh, to engage with our uh, uh, our manufacturers and, uh, and company that we have in the waterfront by doing an assessment. Many years ago, I did an assessment uh, through all the companies that we have in our district, and we find out that a lot of our company those days they needed people that knew how to do Lotus one two three. Uh, uh, a database uh, they know how to do work perfect uh, and what we did is we developed an, orga an organization and a program uh, to ensure that these people will be trained and these people just to be people from welfare 
uh, people who were dislocated and people who was looking for change, change of work for, workforce. And we train all of them and we give it back to these workers. And they was very happy. So I think what we need to do is we need to re, re, uh, re make sure that our organization get the resources they need. And if we defund the police department, it's a lot of money to come down to help this organization. Time. And, if I, I, and we need to do it right. Thank you, Katie. Last uh, community question for this topic area. Um, how do you believe that a rezoning of Industry City would impact the community? This is coming from Alandra. So as a community board member, that was something that um, we looked at. And uh, personally, as a community board mem member, I voted no on the rezoning for Industry City. And I can, can talk through you know, why I voted no on the proposal that was in front of us. Um, the number of challenges that uh, the rezoning proposed, the fact that this entire process is incredibly broken with the urban land use uh, review process that communities have to go through. We don't really have a say. Um, and we are given a, a paradigm and a framework that does not, does not work for us. So as a state legislator and as a state assembly person, there's legislation that I would like to introduce to ensure that anything that pro comes up at the city level for urban land use, that we have certain requirements particularly anything that's along the waterfront that we are both looking at climate impacts and that we are also looking at the the racial and economic and housing uh, impacts that don't just limit rezonings to a particular geographic area which is the problem that we're faced right now um, it's too Time. limited in scope okay so now we're going into round two and we're going to talk about healthcare and education. So we'll start with Kennedy's. Uh, and the question is, after a global health pandemic, many are now wondering about how to rebuild and strengthen New York's healthcare system. Advocates are suggesting Medicare for all could cover anyone in New York State. Is that the right solution to address the inequities in our healthcare system? If not, what would you propose? I uh, I have been a long time advocate for the New York Healthcare Act. I believe that we need to pass the New York Healthcare Act to make sure that we have Medicare for all in New York State. Uh, it is necessary. I think it's a shame that we do not have that in our state and that we, that we don't have Medicare for all in the nation. I think we are one of the, well, of the supposedly the richest nation in the planet. And we, you know, we are not providing our people with basic infrastructure, right? Uh, healthcare is a human right. And if other nations can do it, other nations that are, are more uh, uh, underdeveloped than the United States can do it, then we can do it, especially here in New York State, because we are one of the richest states in the nation. So it is necessary, especially for the working class communities, uh, especially people who live like uh, in Sunset Park and Red Hook, who are part of the working class, who are working low wage jobs, who cannot afford to go to the hospital or pay their rent. It is necessary that we pass the New York Healthcare Act, or AKA Medicare for All. Now, the New York Healthcare Act eliminates nearly all private health insurance. What do you tell those that like their current health plan that there or their current health insurance? I think that's that's uh, <laughs> that's not a question uh, to ask the, the those people. I think it's, it's we need it. It is my responsibility as a assemblywoman to make sure that the people in my assembly district are, are living in the best living conditions that they can. And I think it is my responsibility to do what is best for the majority of the people, not for the few people who have uh, good health insurance, because that's not equitable. I think we need to make sure that everybody uh, has good health insurance. And I think the state can do it. I think uh, those people, I, I will tell them, if you put you know, some of your taxpayer money, then we can have same uh, quality healthcare than the one you currently have. Thank you. Marcela, uh, same question and, and I'll read it for you. Um, after a global health pandemic, many are now wondering 
what about, are wondering about how to rebuild and strengthen New York's healthcare system. Advocates are suggesting Medicare for all could cover everyone in New York state. Is that the right solution to address the inequities in our healthcare system? And if not, uh, what would you propose? I think the pandemic was um, a good indication that our government has failed us. Um, most working class people don't have access to health care. Um, our community uh, includes a bunch of undocumented folks that won't qualify. Some of our working class folks have jobs but don't have health care, can't get uh, paid time off, paid sick leave. And so that really took its toll on this community in particularly because we have folks for who are, are we're in one of the highest asthma rates because of the location that we're at and the, the, year, the closeness to the highway. Combine that with the fact that folks don't have preventative medicine, access to healthcare now, once this pandemic hit, it just made things so much worse. Um, it was a way of trying to prevent it um, but most importantly, the governor also just took a bunch of funding around, uh, away from Medicare, which actually covers poor. So wanting to make sure that that's reversed and how health care should be a basic human right. Now, what would you do to advance this legislation as, as an assembly member? What we're seeing is lack of leadership. Um, this has not been, um, anytime anybody talked about, um, healthcare for all, there was always a question about money. It can't be done, but this is part of the work that I've done for over 15 years. This is the work that I've done to be able to get historic rent laws. You build coalitions. You start with those most impacted. We start working on a solution and we start organizing across communities and putting pressure and talking to our elected officials. We need to make sure that we are active. If, if anything, people taking to the streets and protesting has shown us is that that's what makes changes. Movements make changes. Thank you. Felix, same question and I'll read it again. Uh, after a global health pandemic, many are now wondering about how to rebuild and strengthening New York's healthcare system. Advocates have suggested Medicare for all could cover everyone in New York State. Is this the right solution to address the inequities in our healthcare system? And if not, what would you propose? This is a great step forward to ensure that everybody will have a health insurance and not to worry about it. In addition to that, and I agree with the statement that was made about that we need to make sure that we include not just citizens, but every individual that lives in the state of New York, disregarding of their uh, immigration status. I think it's very important that we include them because those individuals, they pay taxes. Uh, it's, uh, the other thing that I would say, Miss, uh, and I, you know, we allocated, I allocated $11 million to continue to enhance and expand the school health-based clinic that we have in 11 or 12 schools in our district, which it means is that they will be able to hire now, no more, not, not only to have the registered nurse, but also to have a mental health provider, as well as a psychology in those health, health basic, the healthcare, healthcare program in the school. That is one of, of the addition that can be used in order to make sure that our children in our schools will be able to receive and any kind of treatment that they might need, but no child, no family should be left out by being taken care if they do need uh, to uh, health care. And if anyone has a problem, they can come to see me, believe me, and I will deal with that because we have an individual, a person that needed uh, uh, dialysis, dialysis. They didn't have no health insurance, undocumented, three of them. And we Time. managed to have a, a bill to make sure med now, Felix, do you agree with the New York Health Care Act as it is written, or is there anything that you would change about it? I think, I think we, we need to include there that, uh, uh, like I said before, that undocumented for individuals 
uh, very respectful because they do pay taxes in our state. Uh, they should be part of that uh, health care. You know, I was part I was part of the Obamacare uh, when Obamacare put the task force together. And that was one of the biggest issues to make sure that we include them as well. But, uh, you know, they, 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 we, we work very hard to make sure that the Obamacare to take life to, to ensure that everybody will be insured. Another state decided not to uh, 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 comply with the requirements. So I think that we need to make sure that if we're going to have this, we want to have it for everybody, not for only a few people. Thank you. Catherine, uh, same question, and I'll, I'll read it for you again. After a global health pandemic, many are now wondering about how to rebuild and strengthen New York, New York's healthcare system. Advocates have suggested Medicare for all could cover everyone in New York State. Is that the right solution to address the inequities in our healthcare system? If not, what do you propose? So COVID laid bare how the, the inequities that exist in our city and our state and across each zip code are, are so startling. We had, you know, here in our district and across all of New York, black and Latino community members dying at twice, twice the rate um, of, of, white of, of white New Yorkers. And what that says is that that is a uh, combination of so many different factors. It's the fact that we have had the New York Health Act introduced since the early 1990s, the same time frame that our current state legislator has been in office, and it still has not passed. And so we need to urgently pass the New York Health Act. We need to ensure that it extends to undocumented neighbors. It is necessary because it also provides and relieves small businesses who are currently in, in a, a lot of businesses are in a situation where they're carrying the employer costs. We need to make sure that that, again, that allows that the New York Health Act allows and covers for gig workers, um, for any, any, uh, any workers, again, that need to be able to access, access health care. Thank you. Now, what specifically should New York do to prevent a second wave of infections? So I think we're in a situation right now. Again, we have uh, our, our state legislature is is meant to be at work, um, and we have a patchwork of a situation across so many sectors of the society, looking at education, looking at transportation, and trying to understand what we're supposed to do. We need stronger guidance. We need to to leverage the the um, data and the science that we know, and and again provide stronger guidance. We actually need to, for example, in schools, we should not do what Cuomo is doing. We should actually have our teachers part of this process of what it means to go back to school. They need to be part of the decision making process. And educators here in New York City are being left out right now, and they're trying to figure out what their rest of their summer is going to look like and what their fall is going to look like and how they're going to be safe. And this is across every sector of our society. This is across every way that we're going to be rethinking our our uh, how we function as New Yorkers every single day. And so we should, again, as, as time. Legislators. Thank you. Great. Now we go to question two. Shana. Great. Thank you, Rob. Question two is on education. We'll start with Henesis, 90 seconds. Racial segregation in public education has been illegal for 65 years in this country, yet public schools, including those in our assembly district, remain largely separated and unequal with profound consequences for all students, especially students of color. What role should the state government play and what would you do as our assembly person to eliminate racial disparities in investment, discipline, and increase access to quality learning options for our schools. I attended local public schools here in Sunset Park. For a long time, I was a near self student, well, all the way to high school. And unfortunately, I, you know, I know what it is to be in, in these public schools. Um, I think, you know, our, right now our local public schools are on a lot of money and that's the main reason that they are 
underfunded and overcrowded. We need to make sure that we are fully funding our local public schools, that we need, I believe that we need to make sure that we are reevaluating the formula in which uh, the money comes in so that each district can get money according to our need. Uh, I don't think it's fair that we get, you know, the, the funding that we get uh, when we have about 20% of our children coming from uh, unsafe housing conditions and or homeless shelters. I think we need to make sure that we have programs for those children. I personally think that we need to make sure that we are uh, eliminating uh, suspension uh, at all in, in high school and middle school and kindergarten. No child should be suspended from school, um, especially because our communities are the one being targeted. We need to make sure that we have parent involvement in our local schools. We need to give more power to our city so that we can reform the way that the CEC works because it doesn't include communities like us. We need to make sure that we are putting funding so that we can get uh, STEM and arts program, uh, especially for immigrant and uh, children of color. Uh, the local schools get money for ro uh, robotics, sorry, for uh, arts and, and technology, and they're just doing Legos. We Time. need to move forward. Thank you. Follow up, which will be 60 seconds. Uh, please detail the steps that you would take to uh, bring this assembly district the long overdue uh, education funding. Uh, there's a, we, again, I propose that we, I am an advocate for changing the formula in which we get funding. I think that's the key. I think that that's the way we need to go in order to make sure that we are equally funded. Uh, and again, uh, in order to have, in order for the local communities to have more power, we need to make sure that we give uh, major uh, control over the schools and that we are uh, controlling our own system according to our own district and, and distribute the money that way. I plan to continue working with coalitions like I have worked in the past um, to make sure that we are organizing the parents because they are the one in the front line to make sure that we are organizing the students because they are the one sitting in the classroom and can give the best feedback to change the way the education system works. Thank you, Marcela, same question. I'll repeat it, 90 seconds. Uh, racial segregation in public education, uh, certainly impacts this assembly district as well with profound consequences for students of color. What would you do as our assembly person to eliminate racial disparities in investment, discipline, and improve access to quality learning options? Um, yes, I think that um, one thing that we need to understand and know is that our public schools are owed a lot of money. Um, to the point where they had to be sued for it and we still don't have it. Uh, money that we shouldn't be investing in our schools. Um, I mentioned before about removing the police and um, getting rid of the school to prison pipeline, investing in counselors and social workers so that we are um, dealing with uh, discipline issues in a more um, humane way. Um, invest in professional development for the teachers um, our special needs children are also suffering a lot, making sure that they have the services um, that they need. Um, I remember growing up and going to elementary school in Sunset Park and looking forward to the uh, cultural activities that were going on because it gave me an opportunity to learn from others, but also um, share mine. So understanding that we're all coming from different places, but this has to be like a safe place. Um, and wanting to make sure that we have after school programs are very important. The arts programs that was mentioned. Um, <clears throat> something else I'd like to see at the state level is more um, uh, food options, uh, vegetarian, kosher. Um, that's not Time. something provided so that people feel inclusive. Thank you, 60 second follow up. AD 51 is historically a marginalized community, overcrowded and uh, some what would consider underperforming uh, schools. Uh, how would you um, advocate for children to be properly assessed within the uh, education system? And how would you make sure that every student from 
pre-K to 12th grade has access to top schools? I think we need to change the way our school system is. I don't think that we should achieve to sending our child to a specific school because it's special. I think we need to invest in all our school and our education so that our children are provided these opportunities in each and all of the schools. The overcrowding issue is something that's been going on for a really long time. And so we need to make sure that we're providing um, and that we're, we're building for the future. Um, school overcrowding is not something that's new. When I was in elementary school, um, my third grade classroom was in the gym. And so understanding that children need space and children need, um, need, need, need all of these things for learning. Ten, uh, students tend to get evaluations, and I think that the evaluations need to be holistic. I need to, need to learn from that to see what children need and make sure that we're providing Fine. working with them. Thank you. Felix, same question, 90 seconds. Uh, what role should the state government play, and what would you do as our assembly person to eliminate racial disparities in investment discipline and increase access to quality learning options? First of all, first of all, uh, we will continue to keep the mayor accountable. We give the mayor the control of the education system in the city of New York. We need to keep him accountable. Secondly, uh, I'm, one, I'm one of the few elected officials that do visit our schools in the daily basis. Uh, I engage with uh, with the principal, with the teachers, with the with the classes. Uh, you know, because I have grandkids that go to PS 172. I have grandkids that go uh, to uh, PS 1. And I had my kid that went to public school as well. My daughter went to PS94, telecommunications, Sunset Park High School, as we speak. Uh, so, so you know, it is important imperative, not just as a, as a parent, as a grandpa, to, to be concerned about uh, our school system, but also to keep the mayor accountable and to continue to let the governor know that, that we need to make sure that the city of New York, specifically the district that I represent, will continue to get the funding that they need to continue to move forward. We cannot have teachers going out there and buy pencils and buy material for, for our students. I think that that is ridiculous. I'm glad to say that we're moving forward to build four more schools in our community uh, and money that comes from the state to the city, to the Board of Education, with the city council reallocated. And I'm very happy that we are doing that because we need more classrooms, we need more. But we need to make sure that the governor understand that the lawsuit that was brought against uh, the, 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 gov the, the state government about the fair share for education uh, and the quality that the school system deserves in New York. Thank you. 60 second follow up. Uh, state legislators have begun uh, looking at mayoral control of schools. What is your opinion on New York City mayoral control of schools? I think, I think. Uh, uh, you know, I used to work in the Office of Management and Budget uh, in OMB uh, when the city was uh, when the when the when was the controlled by the, a board member. I think I think it's uh, very important to keep somebody accountable uh, when it's come to our children and my grandchildren. And if the uh, the ma if the mayor is the one who's going to be responsible to make sure that the education of our children get delivery, I will continue to keep the mayor accountable for his action the same way that we pass legislation to keep the police department accountable. I think somebody has to be accountable, in this case, the mayor. And if the mayor doesn't do the job, then it's time to, to, be, to change. And, and if the chancellor doesn't uh, uh, listen to the mayor, then we have to do some other stuff. But I think at this point, I will continue to support uh, mayor control and uh, until we can finally find out what other, what other avenue might work. And also parental inclusion. We need to have parents to be part of the process. We cannot have a major control without without have, not having parent, parent participation. Right. And I'm Thank you, Katie, 90 seconds. Uh, racial segregation, again, in public schools um, is a problem, especially uh, in this district. What role should the state government play and what would you do as our assembly person to eliminate racial disparities in investment, discipline, and improve access to quality learning options? 
So I went to PS 503 and PS 102 and graduated from Midwood High School. And that was graduated from Midwood, you know, 20 years ago. And the overcrowding at that time has even gotten worse. And now our educators and our young people and our students are trying to figure out what what is going to happen in light of COVID. And the response that you have from the governor is that he's putting the Gates Foundation in charge of deciding what the future of our education system looks like and not our teachers and not our educators. So one of the first steps that we need to take is actually how are we looking at education and what kind of legislation is being introduced. I want to point out again that assembly member Felix Ortiz has been in office for 26 years since I was a you know 10 year old going to elementary school and what political capital he has where he could force the hand of Governor Cuomo in recent years to actually put legislation through to force Governor Cuomo to choose between billionaires and our school children and he has failed to do that and part of leadership is keeping the promises that you keep and I know that there are schools here in our district PS 24 that were promised $100,000 for ed funding for their arts and education from the assembly member's office, and that still has not been delivered. And so it's not just about articulating here the, the things that you intend to do. It's that if you've been in this position for this long, you've had the opportunity to deliver for our young people and our for educators, and that hasn't happened. Thank you. 60-second follow-up. Uh what would you do to uh, get the um, funds that are owed to the district and how would you want to repurpose them? <clears throat> There are so many, I mean, in terms of the education advocates and the, the Alliance for Quality Education and other organizations that have been um, fighting tooth and nail to be able to bring this to Albany to get legislation passed. That's something that I, again, would partner and, and support. Um, and that would come back to our district. And it's not, again, just about resources and budget. It's about looking at the, the quality of education and understanding that our young people are showing up and it's not just with education. We need to look at housing. We need to look at healthcare. We need to think of them as a, as a whole picture. And so how, how are we supporting them and their families? Um, and it's not just again about looking at the individual support for education, but the, the whole picture. And now we'll go to an audience question. And uh, this question will be for Genesis. The New York State Police Department stations that the New York Police Department stations thousands of safety officers in city schools, an arrangement that has been in place since 1998. The number of police officials assigned to safety to school safety has held steady at roughly 5,100 making it one of the largest police forces in the country. As protests across the country force a reckoning over police violence and city police crackdown on local demonstrators, advocates are ratcheting up calls for New York City schools to sever ties with the police department. Do you think we should remove the NYPD from New York City schools? Why or why not? Absolutely, yes. We do need to remove the NYPD from our local public schools because, uh, as many of you may know already, the police in this nation started to make sure that we are looking for enslaved people who escaped from the plantations. And it seems to be the same type of policy. Uh, police uh, still uh, go after black and brown bodies. So it is not fair to have that trauma inside the place that is supposed to be safe. And that's our second home for many children. Uh, I do think that we need to invest in more social workers. We need to invest in more restorative justice uh, services inside the schools as a safety, as a, as a measure of safety for our children. That way we can prevent uh, suspensions. And we also can eliminate uh, the school to prison pipeline. Our children are, uh, going through metal detectors every day they are treated as felons and that is traumatic you know i, I do believe that needs to change it, it is necessary i think there's all the ways that have been proven to uh to have safety for our children thank you marcella 
for over for a little bit over a decade, New York City schools have been using a funding system called Fair Student Funding, which distributes per pupil funding to school based on characteristics of the students who enroll in each school. However, in New York City, about 23% of the city schools received funding at or above the level to which the formula says they're entitled to. According to the numbers provided by the city's independent budget office, what recommendations would you make to improve that formula? I think the, the, the determination for the funding needs to take a holistic look. Um, we need to look at it. We need to see what our children need. I think we need to start there and determine what kind of services we could provide for children, what kind of programs we could have what's needed and then start working from there. I think that funding is something that's essential. Um, one of the problems that we're having also is our public schools are now in competition with charter schools and they're competing for those public funds. We need to ensure that our schools have the funding that's needed so that each and every child has an opportunity to thrive, that each and, each and every child has an opportunity to grow, to learn, and remembering that. Felix, in 2017, the DOE set a goal to increase the number of inclusive schools that serve immigrant, the emergent multi uh, language learners and students with disabilities. However, many of our families have to travel to schools outside the district to receive these services. As an assembly member, what do you propose to increase services for English language learners and students with disabilities at our local schools? Well, that's a great question because I have been working with kids with disability for a long time. Uh, and, I, and I am one of the biggest proponents to ensure that our kids will be able to stay where they are. I think we need more integration into, the, into our school system. Uh, we need to make sure that uh, our children doesn't have to go far enough to uh, get their education when they can get it nearby. I do have a niece who is uh, who, who is a challenge, and she attends PS94. Uh, so I have first-hand experience with her because they was planning to send her to Queens. And I have a, I have another friend, a friend who three children was uh, trying to be placed one in 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 Bay Ridge and the other one in Paso and the other one in Queens, and they're stating in. They are district in our community. I think that we need to make sure that we continue to fight and put in place mechanism that, uh, and you're talking about legislation. I would say that I will, I will say that we need to build a legislation to mandate that the Board of Education at uh, the Department of Education will be able to please the parents and provide the services in the school. For example, uh, you have PS9, PS24, the school that was mentioned before, that particular school have a, have an integrated uh, integrated system as well as PS P uh, fifteen, and uh, and I'm, I'm a big proponent on to continue to do what I need what I have to do in order to make sure that our school and our our challenges kids will be able to get their services in house that they don't have to go out. Thank you, Felix. Catherine. Assembly District 51 is historically mar a marginalized community with overcrowded and underperforming schools, in particular in Red Hook and Sunset Park. How do you assess the education children are receiving in our district? And how would you make sure that every student from pre-K to 12 has access to these schools? So we have amazing teachers and educators in our schools and they know their students really well. And we have very strong PTAs. We have parents who are doing everything that they can to, to support their, their students. And we can go to our parents. We can talk to our teachers. They, again, are the best, some of the best sources for understanding what their needs are and understanding what their resources needs are and, and, the, and advocating for that. 
Um, it's about, again, I think an a, a approach is making sure that we re, you know, relieve the, the high stakes testing model that exists. We should also, again, it's across the city and the state of New York that your zip code should not determine the quality of education that you're getting. It is, again, political failure. It's political will um, that's needed to actually make sure that our, our families have quality education. And so I would, again, engage engage our families. I would engage our, our educators and mm -hmm. understanding their, their individual needs in their and their schools and their classrooms, and then connecting that with the broad legislation as, a, as advocacy at the state level. Thank you, Catherine. So we've, we're halfway there. We've made it to round three. And the topic for round three is housing and transportation. And Shauna will start with yes. the first question. Thank you. 90 seconds, starting with Henesis um, on housing. With record high unemployment, many are struggling with housing security. How do you propose supporting people and families struggling with rent payments and those that may be unhoused? Uh, I work in the housing court. I work every day. I'm still working <laughs> for the, uh, to help helping tenants who are struggling with rent, unfortunately, uh, from home. Um, and it's very unfortunate. I think this, the state of New York has fell, uh, the working class families. Uh, we wanted to cancel the rent and that's something that I will still push for. Uh, I do think that we need a complete rent relief so that people are not responsible for those months of rent that we are not able to pay during Corona, uh, pandemic and the quarantine because we are not able to work. Um, I do think that we need to pass, uh, First, we need to fully fund NYCHA because NYCHA has been underfunded for the last 40 years, uh, underfunded not just by the state, but the city of New York. I also think that we need to pass universal rent control. We need to guarantee safe homes for all of us, homes free of mold and, and leaking. Uh, I think our communities need to make sure, we need a state, as a state assemblywoman, I want to make sure that our families are not living overcrowded because they cannot afford uh, rent. Uh, we need to make sure that we pass the good cost eviction bill so that people who do not live in rent stabilized apartment, who are the majority of the people in Sunset Park and some of the people in Red Hook have access, uh, cannot get, don't get harassed by their landlords and evicted without good cost. That's something right. that we pass in. Thank you. Uh, 60 second follow up question. Um, how do you propose that we make landlords whole in a district like ours, where many landlords are individual property owners who rely on rental income to pay their mortgage? I, so we just passed, uh, well, Cuomo just passed a uh, landlord bailout uh, on Thursday, and he made sure that landlords get paid. Uh, for the rent that they have not been paid during the, these three months. I think now we are all something for the tenants because the tenants do not get any relief. Uh, this is this this funding that was this uh, measure that was just passed on Thursday is to make sure landlords get paid, right? But it excludes a lot of the tenants uh, and it's limited funds. It's $100 million. And once the money is gone, if you didn't get to apply, you are uh, most likely going to get evicted. Uh, that's unfair. And that sounds very like the PPP program that excluded a lot of the immigrant people in our community and the small businesses. And that needs to change. I think we need to pass universal rent control uh, for all, for everybody. And universal rent control don't mean landlords don't get to raise their rent or don't get paid, but it means that the raises in the rent are fair. And that we have Thank you. Um, I see a comment here that would like us to switch up the order of the candidates. So I'm going to do that. So um, Felix, 90 seconds. Again, the question is with record high unemployment, many are struggling with housing security. How do you propose supporting people and families struggling with rent payments and those that may be unhoused? I am 100% I am agree with Genesis. I think, uh, I think we to make sure that we pass uh, Senator Ginares' bill, which I am a co-prime of that bill, 
uh, no rent. I think uh, we need to make sure that we protect uh, our tenants as well as uh, let me let me say that uh, it is imperative that uh, we cannot wait from the federal government to rescue New York State. I think this president has said it very, very clear that, uh, and he has criticized uh, uh, New York State uh, because he uh, he thinks that he cannot uh, uh, bail New York State or all the state, uh, Democrat states. So any state that is a Democrat being penalized by this president, that is the reason why we're not getting the financial or the resources that we need in order to move forward. So, so therefore, we need to we need to do what we have to do f with the resources that we have, and I uh, and I also believe uh, in order to alleviate all this situation, we need to task to task uh, to ta to task the rich. We need to make sure that we do that, and that has to happen uh, in order for us to ensure that we be able to help our tenants and help the families, and including the undocumented. You know, we have so many of those people coming to our office for help and we and we need to make sure that we be able to be there to help them and we have us fix them so we need to make sure that we do the bill taxing the rich and i and another bill that i have i think we need to also have a conversation about my bill which is about uh, uh taxing and putting a short time to people to people who thank you a uh, 60 second follow-up can the housing crisis be solved with the private market, or does New York need to create new public housing? I think we need to we need to create New York. Uh, uh, we need to we need to build. We need to build, and we need to build fast. And uh, and we need to make sure again. Uh, I, I was finishing with this particular bill because this particular bill, what he's saying is, we get we get we get a three percent or five percent of the profit sharing that every corporate or every corporate uh, board of director make before the profit sharing gets fair and 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 diluted through their staff you know their corporation if we do that we will be able to get close to 100 billion dollar according to the econometric model that i work together with a professor of economy from harvard university this is this is a program that no one's talk about highly, but this is a program that is simple because we're tapping into the profit sharing before the money gets disbursed to any of the board of directors and any CEO of any corporation. And this is also being supported by the Fiscal Institute. Time. Thank you. Uh, Catherine, we'll go with you next. Uh, 90 seconds with record high unemployment. Many are struggling with housing security. How do you propose supporting people and families struggling with rent payments and those that are unhoused? So I can talk about the legislation that I would support. I also want to say that of the people who are debating tonight, one of them is our current state assembly member. And he has had 26 years of opportunity to continue to move legislation through. In April, there was a budget that didn't go for, far enough to, to protect our, com our community. And the specific piece of legislation that Felix did serve as a co-sponsor, the, the Emergency Rent Relief Act, was uh, commented by many that the actual process failed democracy, that it did not go far enough, that it was completely inadequate. And again, he should be using his political capital to pass legislation that is actually supporting this district. So yes, the legislation that was introduced by Michael Guinardas in Queens, which actually looks at canceling rent. Uh, we are in a housing crisis. We were before COVID. And the fact, again, I, I've talked about this before, but Felix not having any support Support and and his in-district dollars are coming from the the hotel and the real estate industry while we're dealing with this incredible crisis our last debate he talked about the fact that the the real estate and the hotel industry are his friends and that's why he's receiving money from them for his his campaign finance funding my solutions look at protecting tenants through making sure we pass good cause eviction, and it also means pathways to uh, home ownership, reinvesting in the Mitchell Lama program for pathway to funding, also Time. using the Green New Deal. Thank you, Catherine. A 60 second follow up question uh, What would be the economic impact of uh, canceling rent? 
I think we have to look at the economic impact of what happens when this moratorium is lifted and the physical impact, the uprooting and how so many families across our district are going to find themselves uh, in homeless and in the streets. And the in economic impact that that is going to have on our community is, is unbearable. Um, thinking about it during the time of year that it's coming, during the summer, thinking of the number of people who are impacted who have not actually, you know, again, if they're even going back to work, how much they've actually been able to make a dent. We are an extremely rent burden community. Um, more than half of our community member, uh, our community members are paying more than half of their um, salaries in rent. And so we, we, we are looking at rent cancellation as a step to think about this, uh, what's been described as a, a tsunami of, of the number of people who are going to be impacted once the moratorium is lifted. And I don't think we even understand and appreciate that, that price. Um, okay. And uh, so now right we're going to- Right now, Mar- Go ahead, I'm sorry, Shana. Marcella? <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. So uh, 90 seconds, um, same question. I can pull it up and read it again. With record high unemployment, many are struggling with housing security. How do you, how do you propose supporting people and families struggling with rent payments and those that may be unhoused? I think the way that you support tenants is first believing that housing is a basic human right. We have to understand that our housing is commodified. Um, and so understanding the system that currently existed before this pandemic wasn't working. And so this is an opportunity to dismantle it and start something new. We could start by canceling the rent for the duration of the COVID-19. We need to make sure that we're taking care of our folks that are homeless and understanding that the shelter, the shelters make money for people and that's why they exist. And in this current time when we have so much overdevelopment, there are, there are plenty of apartments that are open and empty and not being used. We can actually use those apartments to house the homeless people and get them out of shelter. Um, rental payments are very expensive and the current um, subsidies and rental assistance that we, we currently have is outdated. So we can actually provide rental subsidies at a state level, uh, making sure we're um, making sure that we are helping our tenants in NYCHA so we can actually provide funding at the state level mm -hmm. as well. Creating new housing is important, but understanding that that's going to take time. We need to make sure that they are truly affordable for the working class. And we can also build uh, supportive housing for our um, for folks in shelter as well. Thank you. Please uh, provide a 60 second answer to a follow up on what would be your plan for increasing uh, vouchers that would aid the uh, homeless population. Increase the number of vouchers or? Correct. Okay. Or improvements to the voucher system is another way to think of the question. Yeah, I think the, the problem with the voucher system, it is old and it's outdated. So folks have vouchers where there's a rent limit on it. And when rents are currently around $2,000, those vouchers don't qualify. So looking at the program again and making sure that they are updated, so additional assistance and providing funding at the state level, um, yeah, it needs money. And we can tax the rich for that. Thank you. So that uh, we're off to now um, question two in this topic area, Rob. Okay. This question will be for Catherine. Most people in the district use public transportation instead of driving. What's your plan to improve bus and subway service while the MTA faces a multi-billion dollar budget gap. One thing that passed last year uh, after a lot of advocacy and a lot of works was congestion pricing. And what we need to do is make sure that that funding is used and is lockbox 
and actually gets used to go towards our public transportation, our trains and our buses. And the actual process of deciding those routes and deciding which lines need them making, you know, working with the advocates, trans, there's there's incredible groups working on transportation advocacy who know exactly where we need to, to support gaps in our community, to support people who have disabilities, who need to be able to access bus stops, what kind of infrastructure changes need to be made. And it requires that funding and that lockbox funding. And what has happened in the past is that funding can get rated, the, the funding for transportation can get rated by, by Cuomo and used for other things. And so you have to really be vigilant and push back and inch, and and fight to make sure that it's actually dedicated for what it's meant to, to do. Now, follow up. The MTA, which is effectively controlled by Governor Cuomo, is now finally building elevators to make train stations accessible, for example, on 59th Street and 36th Street. Only about a quarter of subway stations in the MTA system are accessible. MTA projections or MTA projects are, are notoriously over budget. Their projects are notoriously over budget. How would you hold the MTA accountable to get these projects done? We have talked a bit about oversight and accountability and transparency, and our community members are using the subway system and are using buses every single day. And um, we're using public transportation. I'm that's how I get around. And it actually looking and working with advocates, tracking, understanding where. Um, what kind of oversight is required and actually having having that accountability and that mechanism in place, which doesn't doesn't really exist in, in full force right now. Thank you. Felix, uh, same question. Most people in this district use public transportation instead of driving. What's your plan to improve bus and subway service while the MTA faces a multi-billion dollar budget gap? Well, first of all, let me just thank all the advocates and the coalition builders because uh, we, without them, we will, be, we, will, we will not have the elevator on 59th Street and 36th Street and 9th Street as well. I think I, I thank them for engaging and, and, and make me to be part of this incredible positive, uh, uh, solution that is now is going to be helping the people of my district. Uh, I'm, I'm a fighter for... Uh, I'm a fighter for the uh, disability community, I think uh, it is very Im important that we get this done. Secondly, I would like also to thank the advocate because for the, with the advocates and the community itself, we brought B37 back to uh, back to uh, uh, to Sunset Park on Third Avenue. Uh, I, I think uh, the, ma the most important piece here is we have to make sure we keep the governor accountable. The congestion pricing has to be, um, uh, the money has to be earmarked to ensure that we have more electric buses in our community. Uh, the MTA uh, came out with a with, with a kind of uh, ask about expanding uh, routes around around the city. Uh, one of the big, uh, one of the, the fight that I have with them is they need to include one route in Sunset Park. We need to bring back B71. I th and, I'm sorry, in Red Hook, B71 is, in, is critical, it's important. We have great to, to them. And I think we all have to work together to make sure that we have more, the most efficient buses in our community. And that, and that congestion pricing has been uh, hijacked by the, uh, Trump. Now, um, there is a 1.3 million square foot last mile distribution center. They're calling it the largest of its kind in the country this is according to the developers and it is planned for sunset industrial park and there's three more distribution centers under construction in red hook how do you view these proposed developments well i think uh, this uh, this this proposed development they're come through the uh, through the city of new york edc and the department of city planning 
uh, uh, most of the time, I am not be very blunt and honest, uh, they would not reach out to our office to, to about this project because they are not uh, lands that is uh, belong to the state. Uh, and this is uh, outrageous. I think uh, that we need to make sure that whatever is taking place there, that we will be able to, uh, our community should benefit from it. And, uh, and our community should be part of the of the of the workforce if they are if they are planning to move forward with all these projects. Uh, it's very sad that sometimes the EDC, uh, which is Economic Development Corporation, take initiative and take steps, and uh, and a state legislator, including the senators and the con and the congressperson, they are not make making aware of some of these projects that take place. And I only can speak for myself. Uh, at this point, but it's outrageous. I think uh, I think there has to be a more transparency from the city level Time. and a more. Thank you, Felix. Marcela, same question, and I'll repeat it. Most people in this district use public transportation. What's your plan to improve bus and subway service while the MTA faces a multi-billion-dollar budget cut? Uh, we need to understand that this is an issue that's been going on for a long time, and we need to make sure that uh, this is this is something that the government needs to fix. We need to make sure that they're not giving away uh, subsidies and money um, to corporations to come into our communities to to bring solutions. Um, and I'm talking particularly about Red Hook and the the BQX, which is being proposed. Um, a trolley that runs along the waterfront that's going to be paid for by a future development. Um, a trolley that is electric uh, that's going to be running through the flood zone. Um, it's going to do nothing when it's also running um, 10 miles an hour. So wanting to increase our buses, uh, we can do something like rapid transit. Uh, we can create bus lanes. I think but one of the things that we need to understand, too, is that we need to make our public transportation free free to all. Um, the city's moved in a really great direction um, with the ferries. Um, however, it's an additional cost. They need to try and find a way to make it um, paid through through the MTA where we can also just use a Metro card swipe. Um, uh, we could start uh, using electric buses as well to kind of help. And the, the theme continues to be um, an issue about money and about funding. And so again, I'm gonna say um, there Time. are several opportunities. So Marcella, 60 seconds. Now, you, you said free, some of these things should be free. Um, how do we make them free if the MTA is facing a multi-billion dollar budget gap? Is that even possible? How do you make it free? So there's a couple of things we need to see. Uh, we need to hold the people that are making these decisions accountable. Um, we have people on the MTA board who uh, don't take public transportation and don't understand what it means. And so when they're making decisions, they're not making decisions as someone who uses the services. Um, an ongoing theme is this issue about funding. And there is a lengthy uh, list of things that we can do, and particularly taxing the rich and different ways that we can tax them. We're talking about taxing ultra wealthy billionaires who, who have so much money that they don't know what to do with it. Taxing them a small percentage could actually make a big difference in allowing us to provide the, the funding needed to provide social services for our most needed, which is our working class and poor. Thank you. Tennessee's same question and I'll repeat it. Most people in this district use public transportation instead of driving. What is your plan to improve bus and subway service while the MTA faces a multi-billion dollar budget gap? I think that the budget uh, problem with MTA is something selective. I do think that our uh, government, our state legislature, and Cuomo especially, uh, can do better, right? So I I am an advocate for increasing our investment in mass transit. I think we do need to uh, reband. We need renewable energy. We need eff eff energy efficiency uh, uh, repairs and also fix the electrical transmissions uh, so that we don't have so many delays uh, with the train stations. I get late to work every day, uh, almost every day. 
because of the train. So that's not acceptable. I <clears throat> organized uh, against the BQS here in Sunset Park. I work in coalition with people from Astoria, Queens, uh, and people from faith community along uh, up roads in Sunset Park so that we don't get the BQS and we were able to win. So I do think that if we continue organizing against uh, the budget cost for the MTA, we can win and we just need to put more pressure. Um, and <clears throat> yeah, I do agree uh, with some of the questions, some of the answers that were given regarding uh, electrical, electrical uh, buses. That's something that we need to do. And in order to fund the NTA, we need to start cutting our uh, uh, so wasting money. We are spending a lot of money on unnecessary developments. And that's where the money can come from, along with taxing the rich people in the state of New York. Now, last year, we lost nearly a half a dozen lives in preventable collisions. And this was collisions between people and cars. Now, many of those deaths occurred on Third Avenue and streets around the Brooklyn Expressway that segregates and cuts the neighborhood in two. Do you have a plan to keep streets safe for people, pedestrians? Um, I think that's uh, something that our city needs to be held more accountable with. I do think that the state can do better when it comes to the Gowanus Expressway here on 3rd Avenue uh, so that we can prevent more death. I think we do need more uh, street lights. We need more safety. Maybe all those safety guards from the school can be transferred to 3rd Avenue and the money will be better spent. Uh, also, I do think that we need more uh, education for the riders. We need our bike, uh, how you call it, uh, bike, uh, bike, bicycle riders. Exactly. <laughs> to to have more signs. I see if I go to Park Slope, I see signs for the riders, but not here in Sons of Bark. I don't think that's fair. Uh, that needs to change. We need more of that. We need to make sure that we have more protected bike lanes and we need to make sure that we are working with the community members before we put any lanes. Uh, I've been uh, organizing here on 4th Avenue and 3rd Avenue where I live with this, uh, business owners because a lot of them didn't get uh, any involvement when it comes to protecting the bike lanes. So they lost a lot of parking and our small businesses lost a lot of traffic too. So that's something that needs to come in conversation uh, with the Department of Transportation and they, the city needs to be held more accountable from the state. By the state, I mean. Thank you, Hennessy's. And now, um, Shauna will give us a question from the audience. Shauna. Great, thank you, Rob. Um, so again, everyone will get an audience question and have uh, 60 seconds to respond. First one comes from Corey, and this will be uh, for Catherine. How are you planning on solving the overpopulation of cars and lack of street parking in our district? Oh, yes. Um, so this is something that, you know, our our district is facing and across the city, I mean, across the city and the state of New York, but um, here as well. And there are, um, there's several different things I think that we that the city can do that the state uh, so just in terms of the differences between what the city can do and what the state can do. Uh, so this would be again in partnership with city authorities. The state, of course, can set um, the uh, the infrastructure investments for the highways. The state can look at how we actually invest in our streets um, for for the the funding that goes into it. But the, the regulations around street, street parking, street sweeping is a city regulated uh, that of, of the divisions of labor and divisions of power, that is something that is regulated at the city level. Um, but I would say that one of the things that I'm- Time. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, next question for Henesis is from Tabina, 60 seconds. What, if any, initiatives uh, do you plan to create or support that would fund Red Hook Houses capital repair needs in order to improve the inside infrastructure of our apartments? 
like I said before, I think uh, we need to start by fully funding NYSHA. NYSHA has been underfunded for the last 40 years or more uh, from the state and the city and the federal government. And that, that, that's the start uh, when it comes to making sure that we are uh, investing in NYSHA. Also, uh, NYSHA has a cap, you know, that they cannot spend over, uh, I think, five mil million uh, in, in, in a period of uh, five years. And that's a limitation that comes from the federal government. And if we change that, then we can allow NYSHA to do more capital repairs. But at the same time, I do think that we need to restructure NYSHA in this way that it does, uh, that it deals with management. Uh, so that way, tenants get more involvement in the process, uh, not only in the process of repairs, but also in the process of management and in the process of uh, making sure that they have a voice when it comes to the new development and the RAD and infield conversion that NYSHA and the uh, uh, governor and de Blasio has been pushing on NYSHA tenants. Thank you. Uh, Marcella, 60 seconds, question from Julian. As someone who was born and raised in the Red Hook houses, I want to bring public housing into the conversation. NYCHA has attempted to build new housing on what they declare to be underutilized land, which are often parks, playgrounds, and community centers. There has been attempts at the state legislature to require any development to go through your LERP. If you were elected, would you support this legislation? Definitely not. As someone who was uh, actively working for the last couple of years on the ULERP rezoning, um, it's very scary to understand how things can happen that are gonna impact us at communities uh, for generations um, through this process when the community doesn't have an opportunity um, to really chime in um, so that is a very scary thought for me. Um, I think that uh, the move that the city is trying to do is in disingenuous, taking away property, uh, open air space, parking spaces, even playgrounds to try and uh, use it to develop um, uh, uh, market rate housing to get money to then invest in NYCHA. And this is an example again of the government asking, allowing, uh, issues like this to go on and on to then ask private corporations to then come in and not, and they're also making money because the government is giving them contracts. This is an issue in a problem. Time. Thank you, Felix, 60 seconds. This question is from Melissa. What is the plan to make the MTA more accessible both at train stations and at bus stops? The, pl the plan is to continue to ensure and keep accountable uh, the MTA uh, and also to ensure that the money that's going to be allocated for them to uh, improve improve the writers, the writing, the writers, and to ensure that our people will get what they really deserve. We cannot continue. All, all the, I'm going to get to this point, by the way. I would say we should dismantle the MTA, uh, MTA members and create a community MTA members where the community will be able to really administer uh, the fund. That's what I will do, by the way. That's what I will put in place because I think the community and the advocate will be able to probably allocate the funding for the MTA for a better use than the people that are being appointed by the mayor and the governor. Thank you. So now we're moving Rob to our final topic area. Yes, we finally made it to the home stretch round four. And the topic is representing a diverse district. Now, Shauna, um, you can ask the first question about uh, transparency. Sure. So every candidate will have this question and um, 90 seconds to respond. All four candidates are running for the Democratic nomination. 
there have been complaints about the lack of transparency and accountability in the, Dem in the Brooklyn Democratic Party. What would you do as an assembly person to address these issues of corruption and lack of accountability? Um, I will start first with Felix, and we would appreciate if you could, in your answer, also address something that came up in the last debate around uh, corruption charges uh, related to campaign funds against a former staff member of yours. 90 seconds. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so let me do it in reverse. Uh, in reverse, it's very, it's very, it's very uh, sad and it's very disappointed uh, that when you throw someone and somebody that uh, that is next to you, that you give all the confidence, and uh, and and probably you might have someone who have stabbed you in the back at some point in your life, and you be completely disappointed about that particular person. Uh, it is uh, disarming. You know, it is it is very sad. That was a very sad moment. That was a very deep. Uh, disappointed time uh, and uh, justice has been served and I think uh, uh, you learn you learn from that mistake and I have learned a lot from that mistake so so now uh, the words of trust and confidence among other people uh, I, I, I measure it very very carefully so I have to make sure that uh, that everything gets done right so so what I have done is I have a team who take care of my finance now and people uh, the, the, the team deal with that I don't have to worry about it because it's a uh, they oversee the whole thing. So I think I think that again, it's very dis it's very distressful. It's very sad. It's very disappointed that you, someone that you get the trust and the confidence, violated yourself and in this case myself, my trust and my sincerity and my honesty. Because uh, uh, you know I'm coming from a from a very base uh, of, of, uh, credibility of families where we trust everybody. And when somebody moves in the other direction and, and the case that the, the way this happened, again, I, I still hurting by that. And I uh, very disappointed Time. that it happened. And, and it's, uh, Thank you. Marcella, same question, 90 seconds. There have been complaints about the lack of transparency and accountability in the Brooklyn Democratic Party. What would you do as assembly person to address these issues of corruption and lack of accountability? Um, I think the issue uh, one of the things that we can do is uh, change the way campa campaigns are financed. Um, the the program that the city has for matching funds is a way to start making sure that we're doing things to make it easy for voters to actually vote and participate in this political process. Um, I am running and I'm not taking any real estate money, any corporation money. I am a people funded campaign and I will be accountable to the people. Um, my job is to work for them. They tell me what to do. I take their lead. Thank you. Genesis, same question. Complaints around lack of transparency in the Democratic Party. What would you do to address this issue of corruption and lack of accountability? Uh, for over seven years, I've been working against corruption in the Democratic, in the Democratic Party. I ran uh, for the first time in 2018, and I ran because I realized that our district leader, uh, Felix Ortiz, and a uh, female district leader, Arelis Martinez, have kept our community uh, away from representation within the party itself. And that itself is corrupted because that the same thing that happens here happens in Brooklyn, uh, in New York State. So I also think that we need to make sure that we are getting rid of the uh, Public Finance Commission. The governor should not be appointing the commissioner who decides uh, who's gonna, if we're gonna get matching funds on that. I think uh, it should be an independent body. I also think that we do need matching program. We need to take money out of politics. We need to reduce the amount of uh, amount of uh, how you call it amount of uh, 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 donations that we get from uh, the public, uh, meaning from private the, from the private uh, donors and corporations and and PACs. That should be eliminated uh, if we such an advanced and progressive state. Uh, but we are not, unfortunately. But we need to make sure that we are reforming uh, 
the systems that allow uh, these bodies to be there. The way that the judges are elected in the county committee, uh, that's not transparent at all. Uh, we need to make sure that we, the people, are electing the judges who are going to make sure who are evicting us in the housing court. Time. That is the change. Thank you. Catherine, 90 seconds. So there is insidious corruption in the Brooklyn Democratic Party, and it starts at the most local level. It happens here in Brooklyn. It happens in Queens, where the, the political powers that be and the political bosses are um, putting people into county committee unbeknownst to their knowledge. I was elected as chair of the Our Assembly District Democratic County Committee, and we organized and tried and knocked on doors and found that there were people here in our district, our neighbors, who didn't know that they were appointed as delegates to this local organizing body called the Democratic Party. And the head of that is Assembly District, uh, is, is Felix Ortiz, is the district leader. He just endorsed someone who provided the names and identities of organizers and Black Lives Matter protesters. This is not the kind of representation that actually represents the, the principles and the, the values of community. The Democratic Party has a responsibility to be accountable, to make sure at the most local level that we're fighting for what our, our, our values are, our, our vision is for the community, how we need support. And at the top of that ticket of the Democratic Party, we can make demands. Here in the city of New York, the top of that ticket is de Blasio and the way that he handled police brutality. Uh, the county committee could require, and this just came out, uh, of organizations call and, and individuals who are calling for de Blasio to, to step down. Um, the top of the ticket at the state is is the governor and Governor Cuomo. So it starts at the, at the most local Time. level. Thank you. Okay. And Shauna, did we want to go to that CUNY question from the audience? Um, I think we should just go with the next question that you have planned. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, because I believe the next question is the final question. Uh, yes. Fantastic. Okay. So we made it and nobody fell asleep. So I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank so you. So here's the final question. And this question will start with Catherine. We are in an age when communities of color are under attack by the federal government and face the brunt of systemic oppression. In an assembly district that is close to 80% made up of communities of color and or immigrants, it is important to take into account the shared experiences of candidates running for office. How important is representation and what makes you believe you are the best candidate to represent this district? What makes you more qualified than the other candidates running for this position? I ran for this seat because the challenges that we are facing in our district have only gotten worse over the last 26 years when Felix Ortiz uh, has, has been our legislator. Talking about housing, talking about transportation. And I wouldn't run if I didn't think that I would be able to be an effective legislator, that I would be able to leverage my experience the experience that I have, I have over the t past 10 years of working across variety of complex challenges, uh, many, many challenges that are very similar to the ones that we're facing here in the district. If it wasn't built on the community organizing and work that I have done here in our assembly district, uh, to be able to be a partner and to go to Albany to ensure again that I am a partner and advocate that I am offering myself as an as an opportunity to fight for this district, to fight for the future of this district, to introduce bold legislation, to be able to bridge um, between all the levels of government that need to work together from the city, from the state and the federal level, um, which doesn't currently happen now with the, the current functioning of our, our state assembly member and how he's, he's conducting his, his affairs and really being able to to bring that voice to Albany and fight for for the for the district. Thank you, Marcella. Same question, and uh, I'll repeat it. We are in an age when communities of color are under attack by the federal government and face the brunt of systemic oppression. 
In an assembly district that is close to 80% made up of communities of color and or immigrants, it is important to take into account the shared experiences of candidates running for office. How important is representation and what makes you believe you are the best candidate to represent this district? What makes you more qualified than the other candidates running for office? Representation is the reason that I'm running. Um, I didn't aspire to be in political office, but um, what I see is Latin women, but none of them really look like me. And so I think that is important. I think that our representatives should be reflective of the community um, that they represent. I, like many of my neighbors, faced housing insecurities. And the fact that I was able to be displaced as someone that, that grew up here, that knew English, that was able to navigate housing court and the different city agencies that are supposed to help you, the fact that I was able to be evicted so easily made me realize that there were so many other people that were vulnerable. And so understanding what that means and wanting to make those changes. I got together with some neighbors, we started organizing and we, we built a movement, not just in Sunset Park, not just in Brooklyn. We were able to get tenants from across the state of New York to change the laws. And so that is something that is important. That's something that we need to be able to do. Um, we need to be able to, be, to build a movement because it's movements that make changes. We have seen the issue of police violence. This is not something new, but it took people going to the streets. It took people exposing themselves, their bodies to harm. Time. To Thank you, Marcella. Felix, same question. And I'll read it again. <clears throat> we are in an age when communities of color are under attack by the federal government and face the brunt of systemic oppression. In an assembly district that is close to 80% made up of communities of color and or immigrants, it is important to take into account the shared experiences of candidates running for office. How important is representation and what makes you believe you are the best candidate to represent this district? What makes you more qualified than the other candidates running for this position? Well, first of all, let me just say that this is a voting right uh, a district. Uh, this is, uh, we as a Hispanics and minority have been uh, trying to fight to make sure that we can continue to keep representation, not just within the state level, but the city and the federal level as well. I think this is, uh, this is something that is very critical and very important when you have such a high number of, uh, of diversity in this community among minority. Uh, my office itself, we have seven people that speak uh, more than eight languages uh, in order to compile with the, with to represent our community. Why the people should send me back to Albany is because I'm not afraid to, to, take, to take on issues. I'm not afraid to step to the plate. I have passed over 100 pieces of legislation with Republicans and no Republican, now with the new Democrat. Uh, I have managed to get bills passed that uh, really make the difference and save lives, such as buying cell phone from driver, testing messaging, uh, uh, organ donation, increasing the database of organ donation in our state for the first time. That was my piece of legislation that we don't need to worry about too much about organ donation. Also, in, uh, uh, mandating that we should build three eating disorder centers in the state of New York in order to address anorexia and eating disorder in, in among our children. That is the reason why I have managed to make sure that we have a school-based health clinic in the in the Sunset Park High School with a mental health provider as well as a as a nurse that know how to deal with eating disorder Time. and anorexia experience. On Thank you, Felix. Genesis, same question, and I'll read it one more time. We are in an age when communities of color are under attack by the federal government and face the brunt of systemic oppression. In an assembly district that is close to 80% made up of communities of color and or immigrants, it is important to take into account the shared experiences of candidates running for office. How important is representation and what makes you believe you are the best candidate to represent this district? What makes you more qualified 
than the other candidates running for this position. Representation is very important, and it is the main reason why I'm running. It is the same reason why I ran in 2018. Uh, I do think that I represent the district very well, not only with my body as a black woman, as a Latina, as an immigrant, uh, as, a <clears throat> as a recent citizen. Uh, I represent the district because the majority of the people look like me. The majority of the people who live in Sunset Park now are recent immigrants, people who are becoming <clears throat> citizens uh in the in the last 10 years and i represent that uh but that's not enough i am the person uh i may i may be the only person in this race who have worked in different sectors i work in the beauty supply i work in the after schools program i work in the public school pro, uh public schools in the district so i know very well the problem when it comes to to our lack of funding in the public schools i know very well what it is to be policed by the nypd but to be followed to be uh accused of you know walking while trans uh even though i'm not uh i understand that very well with my own experiences and i also have faced immigration issues i i was stateless uh until 2013 so those are the experiences of the people who live in the district. I work very hard. I work with the to promote laws against wage debt for the laundry workers. And now uh, I work in the housing core as well. With Corona, I have worked in coalition, not only with the Latino population, but also with the Asian and the Arab population in our district and people from Hebrew houses to make sure that we are truly. Thank you, Hennessy. Well, we made it. Thank you so much. I want to thank the candidates, Genesis, Felix, Marcella, Catherine, um, and uh, I want to to also thank the debate committee for putting this all together. And I want to encourage everyone that tuned in uh, to vote. This is a very important election. Uh, so many things are at stake, especially in this current time in history that uh, we are living. Um, I want to thank my co-moderator, Shana Castillo. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rob. I'd like to invite the viewers the or, <laughs> thank you. I want to thank the viewers to a debriefing of this debate that will take place Monday evening, the night before the election. So if you haven't subscribed to the YouTube channel, please do to stay up to date with everything Sunset Park related. And uh, I look forward to uh, speaking with all of you after the election. Thank you very much. Have a great night. Thank you. Good job. Thank Have you. a great evening. Thank, Thank you, everyone. Good job, Duke. Thank you.